Hello friends, welcome to the video. A couple of months ago, I did a pretty deep dive into the lore behind 21 Pilots and all of their albums, the storyline that they're going with right now. And I had such a great time making that video and it was received really well. And that sort of motivated me to continue on that path. So I looked for my next bit of inspiration and I came across another band that I have loved for a very long time. Today we are going to be looking at the history of and the concepts behind My Chemical Romance. Same with 21 Pilots, I've been a fan of My Chemical Romance for most of my teenage and adult life, so it's really rewarding to get that deeper understanding of what went into their music, to kind of see what the ideas were behind the songs and the concepts and all of it, and I thought I would share it with you guys. But I will say I am not covering everything. We're kind of going to be focusing on the big four albums that they put out because they have a lot of singles and EPs and collaborations. This is specifically concept albums where each album tells a different story. And sure, you could fit some of the singles in with the stories and try to build the worlds that were created, but at the end of the day, they kind of all stand alone in their own little bubbles. So I feel like the clearest way to go about this is to just focus on the big four. And I say big four very lightly, but we'll get to that. <laughs> And before we get any farther in this video, I do want to give a content warning. If you are sensitive to any of the many topics that we will be discussing, if you're not in a place to be hearing that, then feel free to click off of this video. It's fun to watch a silly little video, but most importantly, take care of yourselves. So if you know you're not at a place to be listening to something like that, then get out of here. But with that out of the way, let's start with a very basic understanding of the band. Who is My Chemical Romance? My Chemical Romance is an American rock band that was formed in 2001. And I will say they were kind of a major part of pop punk and rock and you could say emo of the early 2000s. To me, they always exist as part of the emo trio of My Chemical Romance, Fall Out Boy, and then Panic at the Disco, which Gerard has said throughout the years that he doesn't think their music is emo, but really I think that has more to do with the fact that emo has changed over time, so his definition from maybe when he was growing up doesn't fit the music that they made, but to us, that's kind of the new version of emo. Well, emo as it is today, which is nothing like emo as it was um, when I was growing up watching bands like Sunny Day Real Estate or The Promise Ring, that to me is like real emo, you know, what you would consider it. Um, I was obviously referring to what the modern idea of emo is, which is basically a pair of jeans and a haircut. But on March 22nd, 2013, fans received some devastating news that the band would be breaking up. Around six years later, Halloween of 2019, they announced that they were gonna be getting back together and doing a reunion tour. They did 72 shows throughout 2022 and 2023, but since then the band has been fairly quiet. There are four main members of the band. There's Gerard Way, Mikey Way, Frank Aero, and Ray Toro. They all grew up in a rougher part of New Jersey and they turned to things like comic books and movies in order to escape. They all bounced around musical spaces and knew each other through mutual connections, but they didn't come together officially until 2001. And I'm gonna say it throughout this entire portion and really throughout the entire first half of this video, most of the information that I'm getting is coming from a Life on the Murder Scene documentary where they talk about their early years and the first couple of albums and the process behind it all. If you're interested in hearing it directly from them, I would recommend you just watch that because we're kind of just going to be rephrasing it all here. It came out in 2006 and I don't know if there's an official place to watch it. I just saw somebody reposting it, but I'll do my best to link it in the description if you're curious. On September 11th, 2001, Gerard Way was traveling to work with Cartoon Network when tragedy struck. He's talked in interviews about how watching the towers felt like being in a science fiction story, like it wasn't even real, and he thought about how what was taking place would change the world. And it was on this trip to work, watching the towers fall, seeing the devastation, that he started to think about everything that he was doing, everything that he was working towards, and he thought that it felt kind of pointless. He wanted to do something that would make his life mean something. And while one person might not be able to change the world, they can make a difference, and that's what he set out to do. He reached out to his friend Matt Pellissier and Ray Toro, and the three of them laid the foundation for the band. And then as they got things together, they got Gerard's brother on bass, Gerard was on vocals, Ray on guitar, and Matt on drums. The first song that they wrote, Skylines and Turnstiles, directly talks about Gerard's experience watching the towers fall, and it kind of captures what the band was trying to be right from the beginning. Seeing how quickly regular life can fall apart and feeling like you want to make a difference in the world. They also recorded a rough collection of songs labeled The Attic Demos, or the longer title Dreams of Stabbing and or Being Stabbed, 
and the sound was pretty messy and unprofessional, but it was clear that there was potential here. And these demos are what would eventually become their first album, I Brought You My Bullets, You Brought Me Your Love. While recording the album, they recruited Frank, who had previously been a listener and supporter. Again, they had these mutual connections. At the time, Frank had been working with his band Pensy Prep, and he moved over to My Chemical Romance, and the rest is history. Frank's band was a pretty big part of the New Jersey punk sound at the time, and he sort of brought that in to My Chemical Romance. You can kind of hear where his influence comes in. But on the first album, he actually only contributed to two songs, Honey, This Mirror Isn't Big Enough for the Two of Us and Early Sunsets Over Monroeville. The first album that they put out was under Eyeball Records, but in 2004, the band releases Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge under Reprise Records, and they also switched out Matt with Bob Breyer as the drummer. I will say the band goes through a couple of different drummers throughout the years, and we're not really gonna dwell on that too much just because most of the drummers are not that great as people. It's not really something we need to talk about. All you need to know is they come and they go. If you see different people in the stuff that they put out, that's why. While working on this album and touring with their earlier music, Gerard found himself struggling with both his mental health and his addictions to alcohol and drugs, and he felt like using these substances was necessary in order to keep up his stage presence. He had never performed without using something, which was not uncommon to see when you're in this line of work, it's kind of normalized. It's all about keeping up that persona. July of 2004, Gerard said he hit rock bottom, but the band was there to save his life. This is actually the second time that the band saved his life. The first time was when it was created because it gave him purpose. And now again, this band is there for him when he's struggling. And I really don't want to feel like I'm just throwing these words out there. This is all discussed in the documentary. He's very open about all of this. And that was actually part of the reason that the band broke up was because he had started self-medicating with alcohol and he didn't want it to continue to be a problem. The second album that they put out, Three Cheers for Street Revenge, sold 11,000 records within the first week, which was twice as many as the last album had been able to sell, just period. People were very quick to give this album and this band the attention that it deserved. And I will say, before starting this video, before looking into it, I had no clue that any of this was within the album. I did not know that there was any sort of bigger story until I started looking into it. 2006 brings us what I would consider to be their most iconic album, The Black Parade. This 52 minute rock opera is worlds away from what they had been releasing. It's so much more polished. It's so much more put together. The concept is so much stronger. You're following this main character, the patient, as they learn that they are dying. And the entire album features this character coming to terms with that and learning to face death and to not be afraid. And the goal of this album is to make the listeners less afraid of death overall and to kind of embrace life and to live your fullest because you never know when it's gonna end. And the band took inspiration from artists like David Bowie and Pink Floyd and Queen, and the influence can be heard pretty clearly, but it doesn't feel like it's copying. It still feels like it's entirely a separate piece of work, but you can feel where the inspiration is coming from. And then the final of the four albums is Danger Days, The True Lives of the Fabulous Killjoys, which came out in 2010. There are 15 songs, two music videos, and six comics that explore a post-apocalyptic version of California, following a group of killjoys that reside in the outskirts of this place called Battery City, and they're kind of challenging the things that are going on there. In the simplest terms, that's what we're looking at. And I will say, I've seen a lot of people talking about how this album has a strong concept, yes, but the storyline isn't super clear and it changes based on what version you're taking it in from. So if you're looking at the comics or if you're looking at the music videos or if you're looking at the lyrics of the songs, they all are gonna tell a different story, which would make it very difficult to do something like this. I do still think it'd be interesting to compare all of them, so I'm not gonna let that deter me, but there's a lot to take in with that world specifically because it feels like more than just a concept. It feels like they created an entire universe, and I know it's not that deep, but it feels that way to me because I love that album. I love the aesthetic of it so much. Basically, <laughs> Everything that this band puts out helps them process their own lives and it also hopefully helps listeners process theirs. It helps them feel connected to these people that maybe felt like they were outcasts, right? If you ever felt alone, rejected, lost, anxious, this band is there. And the topics of most of their songs are personal and hard-hitting. As we're gonna see, they get into some pretty serious topics that directly relate to the real lives of these people, but most of the albums are still tied together by these bigger concepts. And I will say Gerard has talked, like, clearly about some of the ideas behind each of these albums, but a lot of the information comes from the lyrics and is up to fan interpretation. There are so many layers to each of their songs where you could try and incorporate it into the story 
and the concept that's being presented, or you could take it as how it relates to your own life, or you could interpret it as how it's reflecting their lives, the band's lives. There are a lot of different ways that you can take this music. And I bring that up to say that everything I say in this video means nothing. <laughs> What I'm saying is going to be how I interpreted the music or how I interpreted the concepts or what I could see online as the more popular ideas or just fun things that I notice that I like the way they sound. There is no right or wrong way to interpret these songs. Yes, there is this base concept, but at the end of the day, each of these songs can mean something completely different to every single listener. You can see how their personal stories are reflected in what's being put out, you can see the greater plot that's being promoted, and you can see the things that the fans take away. So, everything here is merely a possibility. This is one way that you could interpret these songs. I'm gonna link back to as much as I can for why I think that's the case, but I don't want to sit here and make it seem like how I interpreted it is the correct or the only way. Because I know how special these songs can be and the last thing I want to do is start an argument over what it really means. So I encourage you, if any of you think something different than what I'm gonna say, please let me know. I would love to hear it. And especially if you were there when the band was more active, I would love to hear your stories. I just want this to be a positive, happy space where we can all talk about something that we enjoy and something that we care a lot about. Whether that be the people themselves or the songs or whatever else. <laughs> With all of that being said, hopefully we are on the same page, we're here for a good time, and maybe we're here to learn some things. Let's get into bullets. Under Eyeball Records, I Brought You My Bullets, You Brought Me Your Love, which was the band's first studio album, came out July 23rd, 2002. So not even a year after this idea had come about, and they're already putting out an entire album. And it was described to have a very raw, garage punk, post-hardcore sound. Honestly, it was described as a lot of things, but above all, what it was described as was not very put together. It wasn't very polished or professional, but it was real. And obviously I can't speak on how it felt to hear those songs when they had come out, but I can only imagine how much certain people probably resonated with the lyrics. I mean, even now they still hold up, so in the moment when those songs are coming out and you get to hear them with everybody else, that must have been such an experience. And the concept that we're going to be looking at for this album follows a kind of Bonnie and Clyde relationship. In this story, you're following this couple before they are eventually gunned down in the desert. And it doesn't really seem like you have to follow these songs in any sort of linear order. They're kind of jumping around in the relationship, which is something that we're going to see for all of these albums. They're kind of just telling bits and pieces of a story, and you could piece it together in a lot of orders and still have it make sense. But the clearest image of this couple specifically that we're following comes from the final song on the album Demolition Lovers, which is the name of the couple, and it's also the two main characters that we're going to be following in the next album, Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge. Really just the big idea here is that they are lovers, right? They are in this relationship, they're in it together. So just really fast, so we're all on the same page about who is Bonnie and Clyde. They were American bandits in the 1930s and they went on a 21-month crime spree. They were believed to have killed 13 people and they robbed a lot of businesses. They went all throughout the southwestern United States, but this kind of became a romance trope a little bit, where it's like this couple that would do anything for each other and maybe it's not the most healthy situation, but they're in it together and they just love each other so much that they would do anything. It's a dramatic daredevil crime couple type of trope. The main thing that I think of whenever I think of Bonnie and Clyde is like Robbers, the music video Robbers for the 1975. It's been used in a lot of popular media, but that's the general idea is just you're following this crime couple and they seem like they care about each other, like they do anything for each other, but at the same time, they're risking each other's lives by living this lifestyle. I'm sure they do care about each other, but they're also constantly putting each other at risk with what they do. So in 2001, Gerard witnesses 9-11, he sees the towers fall, and he realizes that he wants to make a difference with his life. He wants to start doing something for other people to give his life some meaning. He brings the guys together, and within a couple of months, they have an album. The songs were very personal and very intimate. They gave a very real glimpse into how these people were feeling and the struggles that they were going through. Because the entire purpose of this band is to mean something to other people and to maybe save lives. That was the big thing that they said is that their goal is to save lives. And this music did resonate with that audience, the people whose lives needed saving. I feel like that's a weird way to say it, but you get what I mean. Young people that felt like they didn't fit in or that they weren't accepted or they weren't good enough or whatever it is, they could listen to these songs and find themselves within the lyrics. Not to say that all these people are involved in crime, but more just the unrequited love and the betrayal and the guilt and hopelessness that we're gonna see with these characters. Like I said, they're willing to die for each other, but 
they're also just not taking care of each other with that mindset. And seeing those completely normal feelings playing out in a more extreme situation helps people to feel understood. The album kicks off with romance. From what I could see, this is the only fully instrumental piece that the band has put out. The sound is 19th century Spain or South America, and the origins of like the actual piece, they're unknown, but the title of it translates to Anonymous Romance, which is very fitting because My Chemical Romance. Like, we didn't know who they were before, they were the Anonymous Romance, but now we're getting an introduction into, I don't know, it's a very cool way to start an album. And then the first actual song on the album is Honey, This Mirror Isn't Big Enough for the Two of Us. And I saw some people on Reddit, excuse me for quoting Reddit, you're gonna get that a lot, because a lot of what we're talking about comes from people's conversations, which happen to take place online on forums like Reddit. And that's just the way it's gonna have to be, because there are so many videos of interviews or just of the guys talking that are lost. I have no clue how I would go about finding those. So I'm going off of people's word here, but people were saying how this song could potentially be about a toxic relationship of Mikey's, and I don't know where that came from. I don't know anything about Mikey's personal relationships. It doesn't matter, but that's a possibility because obviously Gerard is gonna write songs about the things in his life, including probably his brother. There's another pretty big song that we'll get to towards the end of this video that people also said is about Mikey, and again, I don't know where it's coming from. I don't know where people heard these things. I haven't seen a single person say, oh, he mentioned it at this concert, which I get it. It was a long time ago, but man, is it frustrating when I'm trying to get everything together. <laughs> but this song just jumps straight into a struggle with addiction with the line, the amount of pills I'm taking counteracts the booze I'm drinking. So obviously we've got some issues with substance abuse going on here. He gets to live in this pretty destructive way, even while everything around him is falling apart and he's not really needing to care about any of it. Clearly things are not going well with this person or with this relationship or whatever it is, right? I mean, he flat out says, we're not working out and you can cry all you want to. So this person seems like they're kind of over it. And I will say there is a music video for this song. It's based off of the movie Audition, which I had never seen this music video before, and I thought I had seen all of their music videos. I had never even heard of this one, and I think maybe people don't like it that much. And I don't think it's even up on their, like, actual YouTube channel. I think it's just something that's reposted around, so we can just move past it, honestly. <laughs> Regardless of if it's about Mikey's relationship or just a bad relationship in general, or maybe a bad relationship with yourself and not taking care of the things around you, this narrator, the person that's singing, doesn't care much about what's going on. The next song on the album is Vampires Will Never Hurt You, and we see significant ties to vampires throughout all of this band's work, really. I mean, it kind of goes along with their whole aesthetic of being all dark and pale and having the dark makeup and the red, the blood. Vampires are used both as a literal way to describe, like, specifically horror movies because they're all really into that, but also to describe this metaphor of, like, corrupt power taking advantage, right? Pretty much in all of their songs where vampires are mentioned, that's what it could be tied back to. I don't really feel like I explained that very well, and the vampire shirt is unintentional, but the whole thing with vampires as a metaphor could could be either the literal vampires because they like horror movies and vampires are in a lot of horror movies, or it could be to represent people in power that are corrupt and they're using their abilities to take advantage of people below them, or they use vampires to talk about things that are tempting but ultimately not the greatest for you, or this bigger idea of society as this kind of heartless entity, and it's like, if you give in and if you go join them, then you're gonna be one of them and you want to avoid it. I don't know, kind of this whole thing about temptation and about this one side having more power but ultimately not really having much heart behind it. That's the best way I can think to explain it. The way it literally sucks the life from you and then you become that same thing. I just wanted to try and add at least something because I feel like my explanation did not cover that at all. But this song in particular might be based off of Gerard's relationship with alcohol at the time. That was another idea that I saw floating around and it would make sense considering the issues that we're gonna see a little bit more as we get into the next album. But just in general, he had been playing with the idea of vampires in the comics that he was making at the time. So this is really just another medium to play with that type of character. Vampires Will Never Hurt You was one of the more popular songs off of the album, and along with Our Lady of Sorrows, they stayed on the set list all the way up until the final shows of the band. They were playing these for a decade straight. <laughs> and then the fourth song on the album is Drowning Lessons, which apparently, when they were performing this, the song was cursed, so they only played it live a handful of times. Things would just frequently go wrong when they were performing it, so they stayed away. And this is one of the ones where I saw people saying that it's not 
super linear with the storytelling because it's possible that this song is describing the grief that the man feels after they die. Because it's not a spoiler to say that the couple does die at the end. That's what the story is leading up towards, so this song could potentially be describing the grief that follows that. As if he's reliving the day that his lover died over and over, he can't get past it. He's not the one that killed her, but he certainly seems to feel guilty. That's the vibe that this song is giving off. He's picturing the future that they're never gonna have together. He's thinking of an imaginary wedding, wedding gowns that you can't wear in front of me, and the imagery of rice grains and roses, which are typically thrown at a wedding when somebody gets married. And it does kind of seem like he feels guilty about it, which could either be survivor's guilt, like maybe his lover died, but he's still going on, or it could also be guilt because he kept her going on this path that led to their death. Like maybe she wasn't being as reckless, but he encouraged it and now this is where they've ended up. And this song also gives us a pretty big piece of the story with the line, a thousand bodies piled up, which we're gonna get into in the next album because again, these two are pretty closely related. For now, I would say just keep that number, 1,000 bodies. Just keep it in the back of your head. We'll come back to it. And just as a little side note, I did want to mention that some people interpreted this song as a man literally killing a woman, but I did want to briefly say that the band was aware of the misogyny that was present with this type of music at the time and they were very not for that. They very much did what they could to be respectful. Yes, there is the death of a woman in the story, but they are aware of the ways that it could be interpreted and they did try to address that pretty early on. I just feel like it's worth mentioning because there are so many bands that would take advantage of like how quickly they grew, but they seem to be pretty self-aware. Then we get to Our Lady of Sorrows, which was previously titled Bring More Knives in the Attic Demos. The lyrics tell a story of somebody who's asking for trust. They say, shed your yellow, take my hand. Take my hand and never be afraid. They are very confident that they can protect this other person. But then by the end of the song, they are choking the same person that they just asked them. <laughs> you just asked somebody to put all of your trust in you and now you're literally, you got your hands around their neck. They're in the most vulnerable position and you have full control. And according to the My Chemical Romance Wikipedia, because that's a good source, it said that Gerard wrote this song about an experience that he had with a nun when he was a child, but I do think it ties in pretty well with what we were saying in Drowning Lessons if the guy feels guilty for leading her on this path and then in this song, he's saying, trust me, trust me, you don't have to be afraid, I've got it all under control. And then he's got his hands around her neck. He was in control of the situation, but at her expense. If he had been the one pushing their adventure, pushing the risk, and then now it led to her downfall. And then we go straight into Head First for Halos, which is pretty directly about drugs and depression and suicidal thoughts. Like it's pretty upfront that this is what the song is about. The red ones make me fly, the blue ones help me fall, and I think I'll blow my brains against the ceiling. That really tells you all you need to know about the headspace of this person. <laughs> red pills being stimulants, blue pills being depressants. I feel like we're moving through these songs really quickly, but it's because this is the first album that they had put out and I feel like the themes, you know, you can loosely tie the songs together if you really want to, but it's more of just an idea than a cohesive storyline. And as we're gonna see in the following albums, they do get stronger. The songs do tie in a lot more. I'm gonna have a lot more to say about the next two albums, but this one was really just an introduction into the space. So not only telling the story, but also kind of establishing their sound and the way that they want to express themselves. So some of them are more directly tied to the story. Like we said, Demolition Lovers at the end is gonna really bring it together. But some of these are just talking about their real life experiences and struggles and there's not much past that. We already talked a little bit about Skylines and Turnstiles. It was the band's first song and it describes Gerard's feelings after witnessing 9-11. He talks about how everyday life can feel pretty stale and it can really quickly come crashing down and then what? He flat out asks, after seeing what we saw, can we still reclaim our innocence? Which is immediately followed by the line, if the world needs something better, let's give them one more reason. I mean, it sums up exactly what this band is for. It says exactly, here's what happened to me, here is my thought process, here's what I'm gonna do about it. It pretty much wraps up the fears and the ambitions and the desires of the band at its very core, and it feels like this really defines the foundation of what they are. It's not something that they were saying just for the sake of saying, it's something that they seem to truly believe in. And then we get Early Sunsets over Monroeville, which is one of my favorites off of the album, I think. It's based on the film Dawn of the Dead, which is a zombie movie, and there's a lot of ways that the lyrics can be tied to 
the movie quite literally but also to the lovers. Most prominently this song is talking about losing a loved one but specifically when the circumstances are not ideal, when things are maybe not so healthy. Some lines are more clearly directly about zombies, like if I had the guts to put this to your head, would it even matter if you're already dead? And then the line not knowing if you change from just one bite because zombies biting you turns you into one of them. Like those are pretty straightforward and directly about the movie, but then it's also just in general describing a rocky relationship, which we've seen in Drowning Lessons and we're gonna see in the future songs. There's this feeling of guilt where the man seems to be living on after his lover has passed. That's one thing that we're consistently seeing through a lot of these songs is that he feels guilty because he is still going on or that he's responsible and she is no longer in this world. And throughout all of these songs, Gerard has like noticeable pain in his voice. He sounds really distraught. And yes, these songs do have heavy themes, so it fits what's being sung about, but at the same time, he had extreme pain in his tooth because he had a tooth abscess at the time, so a lot of the pain that you're hearing is very real, very physical pain that is, is happening. That is your not so fun fact for this song. Moving right along, we have This Is The Best Day Ever, which is one of the lesser known songs off of this album. It takes place in a hospital and this pair is meeting in the emergency room, so again, less fortunate circumstances. They both can't take it anymore. The fact that they're stuck here, the fact that death is kind of just around the corner. They can't take it and they fantasize about being able to leave and what they would do. There's no amount of imagining that's gonna get them out of this. At one point they even go as far as to say that they're gonna burn down a ferris wheel which could be a metaphor for breaking the cycle of being in the hospital, maybe going in and out, your health getting better and declining. Or it could also be a more literal meaning where this pair is so over everything that's happened. They don't really care about anything anymore and they're like, let's just go cause some trouble. Let's just go set something on fire because we can. Which does align with the Bonnie and Clyde theme. They want to cause as much trouble as they can in the time they have left. And then there are two songs left in the album. The first one is Cubicles. And the lyrics tell the story of a pretty one-sided romance in the office. You're following this character who's sitting there. He sees a lady that he really likes and he's dreaming about her and he's seeing how great she is and she doesn't know he exists. It's a story we've seen a thousand times. And that's what I was saying about this album connecting to people that feel unrequited love, where they feel like they're putting their all into something and it's not being returned at all. He feels so close to this opportunity to be with her, but then she leaves and she's replaced by another cubicle worker and office life goes on. Especially if this band is trying to cater to people who feel like they don't fit in this song kind of, it's telling a normal experience, I feel like. Like some of these things are kind of out there. They're not things that we are typically going to experience, but something like this where it's just a little workplace romance that isn't reciprocated, that's something that a lot of people can relate to. And if we're relating this to the demolition lovers, I would go as far as to say that the man cares about this relationship a lot more than the woman. Like not only is he more devoted to the reckless life that they're living, but he's also at least in his head, more devoted to her. Not to say that she loves him less, but maybe they have different ideas of love and he feels like what he's giving is not being returned. Like how he would do literally anything for her to be with her or to take care of her or whatever it is. And then I don't know if she would necessarily do the same, but that would make sense when we're thinking about how much guilt he feels at her passing away if he feels this strongly about keeping her safe, keeping her okay. But that brings us into the final song on this album, which is Demolition Lovers, which is where we really get to see these characters. We get to see what's going on with them. And this song sets up the story that we're gonna be following for the entire next album. Demolition Lovers, the song, brings us the death of the couple. They've been running around, they've been living this reckless life and going on their adventures, and they were there with each other no matter how difficult it got, but, they went down a path that they just can't come back from. The song starts off by describing this couple driving down the highway. They have a trunk of ammunition. They're ready for something. I don't know what their plans are, but clearly they are up to no good, I will tell you that. They're driving. They seem to have been caught. There's a pool of blood and a hail of bullets, which is not what you want to see. And then the song wraps up with phantoms and a bed of roses, which is something that you would see at a funeral. At the beginning, we had throwing the rice grains and roses for a wedding that they will never get to have, and now you have a bed of roses instead. And then the very final line of this song, he sings, I mean this forever, which as we will see, he means it forever. <laughs> he would go to any lengths to be with her. That is pretty much 
the one consistent thing that we've seen through almost all of these songs is this person cares so much about his lover and he would do anything for her even if that relationship is completely not healthy and not really good for either of them he is going to do what it takes to be with her forever the song describes how the couple went down in a hell of bullets but more than anything it's showing how he would do anything for her and it becomes clear how true this proclamation is in the next album three cheers for sweet revenge we're gonna talk about the story behind this album in a second, but first I wanted to give just a little bit of context for where the band was at in the real world. For one thing, the band switched out Matt for Bob Breyer and he stayed with the band for this album and the next one. I would say he's probably the most recognizable drummer associated with this band, but again, a lot of the drummers have had issues. Just because he's the most well-known or the most associated with the band doesn't mean that he's a great person, although I will say there were a lot of Bob and Joyers in the day. <laughs> On top of that, 2004 is when Gerard said that he had hit rock bottom, when he was having trouble with substances and his mental health. He was just at his worst in 2004, which is when this album was happening. The band had been growing up really fast, and especially with how celebrity or how rock culture was at the time, his behavior was kind of normalized, like the things he was doing. There were a lot of videos circulating at the time, specifically I think they came from the Life on the Murder Scene documentary, but there are a lot of videos that had gone around of Gerard like falling over drunk. And it's weird to look back at it because at the time I was watching these edits of people being like, oh look, he's so funny. Like he's falling over and he's mixing up his words. And sure, maybe to 13 year olds who were editing all of those clips together to be like, oh look at my favorite band member, he's so goofy. I guess that could be funny. But looking back at those videos now, it's actually really difficult to watch because you can tell that he's just not in a good place. It's really hard to watch, but it also does kind of clarify where this album and where the last album were coming from because the topics that are so serious are coming directly from his own experiences. July 2024 was kind of the turning point for him where the band was there to support him and everybody that was working with them would stay up on the phone with him overnight to make sure he's okay, that type of thing. There was a whole support system and he did start to get better. Eventually he was able to get completely clean and sober, which I can't say that that has stayed true for this entire time. Like I said earlier, part of why the band broke up in 2013 was because he had been going back to alcohol and he didn't want that to become an issue. And that's the thing is he got clean when he was struggling at his worst all those years ago. And maybe he's had instances where those habits have come back up, but at the end of the day, that's just how it goes. When you're dealing with mental health or when you're dealing with addiction or that type of thing, it's very hard to just beat it and then be past it. It's kind of a lifelong thing of temptation and choosing what's best for yourself and having a support system that can be there when you're struggling and all of these things. And just because maybe you fall back on some bad habits or you have a rough couple of days or weeks or months or years, or whatever it is. So I'm saying that with as little judgment as I can. Yes, he was struggling with substances at the time. Yes, he did manage to get out of that. Yes, maybe he has struggled with it since then, and all of that is completely normal and okay. That tiny little rant over. This was a huge thing for the band. Gerard had never performed without substances before. He was always on something, and that was part of his persona. He felt like he had to do that to perform, and for the first time with this album, Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge, he was not doing that. The combination of Gerard being clean and a new drummer made this sound like a completely different band. And when they talk about this album compared to the other one, they say that Bullets is kind of the band finding itself, but this album is the band. Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge really is what they came to do. There's a completely different level of confidence in the performance of everything that they do here, and it just sounds so much more put together. They wanted to keep up with the theatrical aspect of things, and you can see this shining through more and more with each album, because they wanted to give fans their money's worth. They wanted to create the best experience, so they put on a show. And the success of the previous album allowed them to really focus in on the specific style and the specific sound that they wanted to have, and it allowed them to have more creative and artistic freedom. So with that sort of background information about where the band was at, out of the way, Let's get into the actual concept behind this album. And a lot of what I'm about to say here either comes from genius annotations and interpretations, or it's gonna come from this video essay. I'm gonna reference it a couple times throughout this section because I think it's just a really good explanation of the album. And if you wanna see a more in-depth, like just this album conversation, I would recommend checking out that video. I don't wanna sit here making it seem like I'm just coming up with all of this. So I wanna give credit where credit is due. So. Three cheers for sweet revenge. You're following three main characters. You have the man and the woman from The Lovers, and you also have the devil. The basic story of this album follows the demolition lovers who in the previous album were gunned down and killed. In this album, you're following the man 
who went to hell and makes a deal with the devil where if he can collect the souls of 1,000 evil men, he can be reunited with his lover. So we know for sure that they were separated in death and I saw some people saying that maybe the woman survived and the man died and that by completing this deal, he's gonna be sent back to the world of the living. But I think it makes a lot more sense to say that they both died, she went to heaven, he went to hell, that type of thing. Because it wouldn't really make much sense for him to just go back to being alive. It makes a lot more sense if they were separated and the devil is making this deal sort of like it's repentance. Like if you can give me these evil souls, if you can do this thing, then in return, I will send you up and you can be with her forever. But then I also saw an interview clip where Gerard said that she's not actually dead and that could have been him misspeaking or it could have been him meaning something else. But regardless of whichever way you think it went, most of the lyrics can still be applied. All we really need to know is that they were separated the man made a deal with the devil, and if he completes this goal, he'll have the opportunity to see her again. I tried to point out the line, a thousand bodies piled up, and this is where that comes into play, the thousand souls. And I think this concept is so cool to look at and to see within the songs, because before looking into it, I had no clue that any of this was there at all. And then on top of the concept, the songs and the themes throughout this album are really heavily influenced by the death of Gerard and Mikey's grandmother, because when it happened, everybody in the band felt the loss and they wanted this album to reflect the experiences that they were going through. So yes, there is this bigger story of revenge and guilt, but throughout that, the bigger thing that we're looking at is really grief, dealing with death and loss, which Gerard has talked about how he used to, as a kid, struggle with the idea of death and the idea that his parents were gonna leave him and he would just be there, which I think is a very common fear that we all experience at some point, but he said over time he was able to accept it and now he can see the beauty of it all. Especially when you're young, the idea of death, the idea that it is inevitable and it's going to happen to all of us, it's a really scary thought to have. And this album, really along with all of their other work, is focusing on life and death and encouraging people to not only be alive but to want to live, to actively make that choice. The fear of death or dealing with grief or, you know, all of these really big feelings are kind of universal, so it makes sense why these songs resonate with so many people. I don't need to sit here and explain to you why that's special, it just is. The first song on this album, Helena, really isn't lore related. This one is just directly about their grandmother. Gerard had explained how she wouldn't want her passing to be a sad thing, so this song is kind of in celebration of her. The focus on the good rather than the sad part of it. For most of this album, there are behind the scenes videos for the music videos, and they talked about how this music video was probably the hardest to shoot emotionally, but it was representative both visually and artistically of the direction that they wanted to go in. Like, there's nothing to say about this. It's just a really heartfelt video. It has a special place in all of their hearts. That's all I got. <laughs> The second track on the album is Give Em Hell Kid, which is where the story properly gets started. So where the last album was a lot focused on guilt and dealing with bad relationships or maybe feeling like you're unloved or all of these things regarding the other person, this one is very much about missing somebody and dealing with the feelings that arise after death or a separation. In this case, we know the lovers are separated by death, but there's a possibility that they can be reunited. You're grieving, but you're also kind of hopeful because what if you can see this person again? And the song starts with the narrator, who is presumably the man, leaving a city while pumped up on a stimulant because he's got this task and he's determined to see it through. He's doing what he can to maximize his productivity and to get ahead. And he asks, can we settle up the score, which is a phrase that means to take revenge on something. So it could be revenge on the people that killed them, or it could be just revenge against the world for separating the couple. He's mad, he came back with a vengeance, and he's gonna take it out on everybody. <laughs> and in the chorus, he sings that he misses her more every single day, which I saw some interpretations saying that this song switches perspectives when you get to the second verse and you get to hear from her, which if we are reading that part from the woman, then she might be even blaming him for the situation, as if he got them into this mess, which would align with what we talked about from the first album, where it seemed like he was a lot more into this chaotic lifestyle and he feels guilty for her death, maybe because he's the one that pushed her to do these extreme things. So it would make sense if now, in death, she is blaming him for what happened. This is a really fast-paced introduction to the story, and Mikey and Gerard both talked about how much they enjoyed 
playing the song live, which completely makes sense because it seems like so much fun. The energy of this song really sets up the story that we're about to follow. Then we have To The End, which is based on a short story called A Rose For Emily by William Faulkner. I feel like sometimes it's hard when it's based off of stories or movies or whatever else because sometimes they are very explicitly about that other thing. So it feels like you're kind of reaching to make it fit into this story. But to be fair, we kind of are. Again, all up to interpretation, so who's to say? So in the story, the main woman, Emily, kills the man that she was supposed to marry because she doesn't want to be separated from him and thinks that's the only way to keep him forever. And I'm not going to pretend to know more about that story than I do, but that's the general idea. There are lots of references to weddings, which goes along with the dead husband from the story, but it also could hint at the life of the man, where it's possible that he's taking his goal and he's maybe going a little too far with it. He sings, the wedding party all collapsed in the room, so send my resignation to the bride and the groom, and it sounds like, if we're taking that at face value, that the man just crashed a wedding and then killed everybody there. And he's kind of sarcastically talking about the bride and groom. And the thing is, the task is to get 1,000 evil souls. So if you just show up at a random wedding and you take down everybody that's there, that's not really helping the goal. That's just doing it for the sake of doing it. So it seems like right away he's all in with this task and he's kind of unhinged. He's kind of just doing it. He's not just targeting evil people. He's having fun with it. We get lines like, he's not around, he's always looking at men, which could be taken as he's looking at men because he's attracted to them, or it could be he's looking at men because he's so obsessed with killing them. Connecting it to the short story, I'm pretty sure the reason that their marriage wasn't gonna work out is because the dead husband actually was gay. But in this, as we're gonna see, it could go both ways. <laughs> we're gonna see more to suggest that this man may be questioning his sexuality a little bit. He's having an identity crisis. And that brings us straight into You Know What They Do To Guys Like Us In Prison, which in this song, the man seems to have been caught and went to jail. It's a little bit of a roadblock in his mission. He was out, he was killing so many people, and now he is in prison for it. We're not gonna question the logistics of this, of how he's dead and then back to life and then killing people and then in prison and then he's gonna get out and then just listen to the story, okay? We don't need to question how it's happening. The introduction to the song sets the scene where we see his capture. They say, come with your arms raised high. And by the way, he's singing this. The words that he's using makes it really seem like he did not think he was gonna get caught. You can really feel his arrogance, like he thought he was gonna just do all of this and not face any consequences. And then in the chorus, he says, we're just two men as God has made us. And it seems like he may have recognized that he has some romantic feelings towards men. Maybe this unintentional pause in his killing spree has actually led him to explore his own personal feelings. Maybe it's with another inmate, but he's starting to deal with this inner conflict because this entire time he's on a quest to get back with his female lover, so what happens if all of a sudden he could have a lover that's not her? And I will say the genius page, the explanation links to a deleted Tumblr post where Gerard had apparently said that this song is homoerotic, but that he himself is not a homosexual. But then people also think that this song might be about his personal experiences with Burt McCracken of The Used because they went on tour together and might have had, I don't know. It's possible that they had had similar experiences to what's being described in this song, but in the chorus, he wonders if after what he's done, he'll still be able to reunite with his lover, but he does still have faith that it'll work out between them. And then we get one of my favorite parts of this album, or of this song at least. They all cheat at cards and the checkers are lost. My cellmate's a killer, they made me do push-ups and drag. They all cheat at cards and the checkers are lost. Two very casual, very normal games. They're playing cards or they're playing board games. Those are very normal. Immediately with the contrasting line, my cellmate is a killer. <laughs> And the way it's framed almost makes it seem like he wants us to feel bad for him. Like, he's in this situation and he's locked up with a killer. How terrible. But obviously, we know that he also is a killer. He's done so much worse. And the contrast between cheating at a card game and being a killer. If we pair those two lines instead of pointing them against each other, it kind of seems like you're trying to normalize the killing. Like, oh, they cheated at cards and they're a killer. Like, oh, all these bad things. They're such bad people. They do all of these things. But Clearly, some things are worse than others. Those aren't exactly the hobbies that you would group together. And then the line, they made me do push-ups in drag, doesn't feel like it's confidently being stated like the other ones were. It feels like it's being cried out. And it almost seems like the other prisoners have chosen to assert their dominance over him. They made him do push-ups in drag. It's kind of, it's a humiliation thing. Like they are showing that they have more power over him in the situation. He questions if he's losing himself here, but doubles down on the fact that nobody would really care. Not only has he taken on this seemingly impossible task, 1,000 people is a lot of people. 
But on top of that, he's in this uncomfortable situation and he's questioning a core part of himself. There is a lot going on with this man. The weight of it all is starting to get to him and he starts thinking about getting some way out to abandon this quest or to escape the prison or whatever it is, maybe some combination of the two. It's just all so much all at once. He's been through so much up until this point, but there's still so long to go and is it even really worth it? And then the line, I won't go down by myself, but I'll go down with my friends, could suggest that he's maybe trying to break out with the other prisoners. But it could also mean that he's willing to die while taking out the people that killed him. Like, if I go down, I'm not going down alone type of thing. He had been feeling pretty hopeless, but with this final line, the spark reignites. I'm not okay, I promise, is one of their more popular songs, but it's another one that isn't super based in the story. And you could definitely argue that it is because the character clearly is not okay. I think we can all agree on that. It could be describing his current situation where he's going through this identity crisis and he's not sure if he wants to continue and all of that, or it could be a prequel that sets up his reckless behavior and the mindset that went into everything that we've been seeing. But truly, I think the song is best when it stands alone. It's not super deep, but it's kind of iconic and I think it's exactly what it should be. It's simple and it's straightforward, but it's absolutely perfect. And then that moves us into The Ghost of You, which is one of those songs where I could genuinely cry every time I listen to it, purely because of the music video. It hurts my heart so bad. And this is another one of those songs where people have argued there could be a split perspective between the man and the woman. And I'm really not going to do a line by line breakdown of that possibility. If you are curious, the video essay that I referenced earlier does, I think, go through the entire song. Really all that you need to know is that he's worried he might never see his lover again and he's wondering if he should just end his own life. And on the other hand, she might be longing for him from wherever she is. She doesn't know what happened to him, right? But then we see him and he's questioning everything. He doesn't even know if it's worth it to go find her. What if after everything that he's done, he goes to see her and she doesn't want him anymore? There's grief and you can feel the distance between them, but there's also this feeling from the man where what if after everything he's done, it still won't be enough. The Jet Set Life is Gonna Kill You is the seventh song on this album, which the term jet set lifestyle usually involves a lot of traveling and luxury, but also living a little carelessly and using substances and the things that we've been seeing. And this song does seem to be a bit more tied to their real life experiences than the life of the character, but again, either way. It's talking about this unhealthy type of toxic lifestyle, but using this metaphor of a woman in an unhealthy relationship and it's talking about this kind of self-destructive cycle between luxury and unhealthy behaviors, which makes sense when we think about what was going on at the time with Gerard. The song pretty clearly paints this picture of a struggle with mental health and addiction that is just ongoing and it seems like you can never get out of it. The same substances that you're using as an escape are also the things that leave you feeling completely at their mercy. There's an illusion of freedom, for sure, that comes with the luxury and the opportunities that are being presented, but really the bad habits are dominating kind of every aspect of life. And the one interpretation that really stood out to me that I liked was pull the plug but I'd like to know your name, describing how the man could be asking for death but still feeling attached to this unhealthy relationship or the substance or whatever it is enough to want to know more about them. I would like to get to know you but I don't value my own life. Those were a couple more personal songs but Thank You For The Venom brings us fully back into the story of the lovers. And when Gerard was talking about the meaning of this song in an interview with Gary Hampton, he said that the line, I wouldn't front the scene if you paid me, is commentary on the music scene of the time, stating that they don't want to be the poster boys of rock, but that just is how things went. And the entire song is sort of highlighting the progression of their success and how quickly they grew to be such a famous group, even though that's not really what they went into this wanting. They wanted to challenge the music environment by creating a bigger community within their listeners. And while they might not be super liked by everybody, they were determined to mean something to the people they cared. When we're taking the story into consideration, he says, sister, I'm not much a poet, but a criminal, and you never had a chance. When he's saying sister, he could be speaking to a nun, saying you never had a chance to convert me, keep me in your religion, or just that she never had a chance at survival. Because in one of the following lines, he asks what it's like bleeding on the floor. He killed the nun. <laughs> this man was made to kill and he seems to be again mocking her the same way that he was talking to the people at the wedding. Even when he's doubting himself, he still has this persona of confidence and cockiness. And in the second verse, he says, I keep a gun in the book you gave me, which we can assume that that's referring to a Bible. There is no saving him now. He literally, he already made a deal with the devil. Like he knows he's beyond saving and he's not gonna say that the church has any chance to save him because he already knows that he's gone. And at this point, it could even be that he's feeling resentment towards God for taking his lover away. Maybe he's grateful 
grateful for the devil giving him this opportunity. He sings that nobody can help him, no matter what they try, but also nobody can stop him. <laughs> he is doing this no matter what, and it doesn't matter what anybody else does for him or to him. He's on a mission and he's going to accomplish it. Similarly to To The End and I Know What They Do to Guys Like Us in Prison, he seems to be challenging the world. He's singing with such confidence, and I wonder if there's a part of him that's maybe hoping something will be able to stop him or that something will be able to save him because it's almost to the point where this confidence can't possibly be genuine it feels like he's putting on this show and sort of challenging somebody else come in stop me save me and i'm wondering if a part of him wants that just so that it can all be over because like we saw in the previous songs there is a part of him that wants this to all be over there's kind of this underlying feeling of desperation because he's singing out if this is what you want fire at will like he thinks he's not gonna be able to be stopped but at the same time try. <laughs> and then we get to the 10th song on the album, which is Hang'em High, which this song is most likely referring to a Clint Eastwood movie from the 1960s, which is a little bit fitting when we think about what happens in that movie. Because in the 1968 movie, you're following a gang of men trying to kill the main character for a crime that he didn't actually commit. And then he goes out to seek revenge on that group of guys, which we've seen. And typically in Western movies, you do see cowboys with guns. So all of that makes sense and goes along with this story as well, where they had the car full of ammunition and they got shot down. And there's just that overall same feeling of wanting revenge. And according to some random post on Reddit, because that is just the type of source that we're going off of. Gerard talked in a Rolling Stone interview about how the song helped him to imagine fighting back and standing up against your bullies. Try as I might, I could not find that Rolling Stone interview, but that explanation would kind of make sense. The bridge bounces between she won't stop me and put it down. She can't stop the murder spree, but then put it down could maybe be her asking him to. The idea that she is begging him to stop, but he's not stopping for anyone. Like we've seen, this man cannot be stopped. Or it could also be his own thought process. Like, she can't stop me, but then he wants to put it down because he doesn't want to be doing this. The whole song just has cowboy vibes and it's fun to listen to. <laughs> and it did get some bad publicity from people saying that it's encouraging violence, but if we are considering the context that it might have been written as a way of talking about fighting your bullies and standing up to the people that are trying to tear you down, then I do think that's fine. It's not encouraging you to start beating people up, but it is saying stand up for yourself. The song, it's not a fashion statement, it's a death wish, kind of feels like the peak of his desire for revenge. Not only revenge against the people that killed them, but also revenge against his lover for leaving him and making him feel like he has to do all of this. The lovers might've had some good times together, but it seems like they had also talked about how that wasn't always going to be the case. They had maybe acknowledged that things were gonna get rocky and clearly things have gotten more complicated since they were last together. Despite this, he is still fighting. He is still holding on until the day that they can be reunited and he can see her again. In the chorus, he sings, I'm coming back from the dead and I'm taking back what was stolen, which we could say is revenge against the people that killed them, or it could be revenge against her. It kind of feels like he's losing himself and he's starting to blame her for everything that happened. The second verse of this song starts off with hip hip hooray for me, which is literally a three cheers for sweet revenge. How did I never notice that in all of my times listening to the song? He says he's painting the walls with pitchfork red, which is clearly a reference to the devil with the pitchfork. His conscience is stained with all of the blood that's been spilled. The bridge kind of gives us an idea of the lengths that the man would go to get his revenge, where he says he would climb out of the grave, or in this case, crawl out from hell. And in the outro of the song, he sings that in the end, they'll fall apart, which is as unstoppable as the leaves changing color. It is inevitable that they will be torn apart. He's clearly suffering. And like we talked about in the prison song, he could be hoping for an escape through death. Cemetery Drive, where the last song showed us kind of a high where he's willing to do anything to get his revenge. He's going to all these great lengths to get back at the people that caused him suffering. This song swings us in the complete opposite direction. In this song, he is mourning. He is having a bad time. He goes to his lover's grave and he cries out about how he misses her. But as he's going through the cemetery, he starts to hallucinate her there beside him. And he doesn't want to believe that she's really gone. He's doing everything that he can in his head to hold on to her. And while he sings, I won't stop dying, won't stop lying, you can hear the lines, are you there at all? Do you care at all? In the background. And it just overall seems like there's a lot of self-doubt creeping in where he knows you know, some part of him knows that she's dead. He went to her grave. He is actively walking with her ghost, but he doesn't want to accept it, that this is what really became of the two of them. And when he sings, is this what you always want me for? It almost sounds like that's being asked to the devil. Like the devil sent him on this quest. Is this what you wanted from me? And then the song ends with the line way down being repeated, which could probably be talking about lowering a body down at a funeral. Although obviously it could also be talking about him 
being way, way down. <laughs> Overall, where the last song was a high, this song just feels very hopeless. And then we get to the very final song of the album, I Never Told You What I Do For A Living. And the big feeling here is desperation because at this point in the story, he has killed 999 men. There is one evil soul remaining, but there was a trick. He was ready for this to all be over. He's getting ready to see her that night and he's excited, but he still feels this guilt over what he's done. But at the end of the day, it's overshadowed by this greater feeling of I get to be with her again. And he did what he had to do, but there's also now forever a stain on his life that can't be cleaned. He is haunted by the decisions he's made, but he's also sticking through. He's going to follow through with it because he's made it this far. There's this repeated line when we're getting towards the end of the song where he says, and down we go, and down we go, and down we go. And when I listened to that, it kind of gave me the same feeling as when Beetlejuice is getting summoned where you have to say his name and each time you say it he gets more excited and more hopeful that whatever he's been wanting is going to happen. He's saying it and down we go and he's done all these things and he's got one more evil soul to collect and then he'll be with his lover and it'll all be great and then the devil reveals who the final soul is. The line we all fall down is followed by the most devastating cry of I tried that I've ever heard. <laughs> and if you're just listening to the song, you might think what could possibly have happened in that short time that completely changed his personality where he was so hyped and so excited, way down, we're all going. I did what I had to do and my life is stained, but I'm gonna go see her to now, I tried. And I hate to say that I have no clue where he said this, but somewhere along the way that people talk about what I can't find. I think out of everything, this is probably the one point where I would love to see where he had said this. So if any of you know, please let me know. In that part of the story, the devil has revealed that the final death after all of that must be his own. He did so much to be with her, but it's all kind of a cruel joke because the final task is to sacrifice his own soul. So really, was there ever any chance of him getting to be with her again? Or was he always doomed to just be with the devil in hell. He did all of this and for what? At this point we can kind of see him bouncing through every single area of grief where one moment he's yelling that they're gonna live and love and laugh together, they're gonna be reunited and it's gonna be great and he's fully in denial about this thing that he's just learned and then the next he's saying it's better off this way because she probably wouldn't like him anyways after everything that he's done so maybe it's for the best. He tries to beg and bargain with the devil saying just give me one more night and then he's just he's bouncing between every single emotion and it's really heartbreaking to witness once you know what's happening. <laughs> and then the final lines of the song call back to how they first went out saying that they both got shot and now they're dead. <laughs> After all of this, nothing has changed. And that's it. That's the end of Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge. And that's the end of the story of the lovers. Unless. If we go just a little bit farther, we can potentially add some more to wrap up the story. Bury Me in Black and Desert Song are both part of the Life on the Murder Scene album that came out two years after Sweet Revenge, and you could argue that they tell the final pieces of the story. Bury Me in Black, which is the first of the two, is just flat out angry. Like he's past the denial and he's past the grief and he's past all- now he's just mad, specifically at the lover. He is blaming her, truly. He sings, I bet you're not so pretty on the inside, and it really feels like he resents her for getting to a better afterlife than what he was able to get to. Like, she got to heaven, but she's not really that much better of a person, and she doesn't deserve it. Why should she get to be happy and get to go to this peaceful place when he is forced to suffer? But then throughout that all, he's still talking about how he's not that great of a person and how he's done things that he doesn't want people to know about, and that's just sort of the state that they're in now. He's stuck without her. He still feels like maybe it's for the best because she wouldn't like him how he is, but also he doesn't like her because why should she get that? And then we get Desert Song, which is very much more, more a personal story, I think. It directly talks about their real life experiences, but I like that people have said it sounds kind of like an end credits song for this story. Gerard was drunk in the recording and it captures a low point for him. He sings lines like, I can see you awake anytime in my head and did we all fall down, which does tie it to the story of the lovers. Those are both ideas that we had seen previously, the idea of seeing you in my head as he's walking through the cemetery and then did we all fall down, obviously, in the last song. In the end, there is no clear and easy resolution for this couple. The man tried to cheat death by making deals with a force that ultimately could not be trusted and they're really really was never any hope for a happy ending. The storyline follows this conceptual horror story, but the themes of grief and loss are really what stands out throughout all of these songs. It is incredibly difficult to accept the inevitability of death, but at the end of the day, we're all going down. <laughs> and to be able to find comfort in that fact rather than fearing it is a powerful thing. And with that album out of the way, we move into The Black Parade.
no extravagant makeup or outfit for this one. The makeup really irritated my eyes and it's two days before Halloween and I really just, I don't feel like doing it today. Regardless, we are still here to tell a good story. So the album The Black Parade came out 2006 in October and the concept is laid out a lot more clearly. With the other ones, you kind of had to piece together phrases to make the story and based on what they were saying in interviews. But with this one, I feel like you can kind of follow the story from the lyrics alone. The initial concept was introduced when the band went to perform at a concert, but then instead of My Chemical Romance coming out, they said, actually, My Chemical Romance can't perform, so this other band, The Black Parade, is gonna come in and take their place. Because not only is this a new concept for the album, but this is an entire alter ego that the band was taking on for this period. They had kept things pretty quiet when they were working on it because they felt like this album was really gonna be something special. And they were absolutely right, because when it came out, it was so much. <laughs> it's a rock opera that's inspired by artists like Queen and Pink Floyd, and it was clearly their best produced sound. They were nominated for the Best Alternative Group in 2007 American Music Awards. The album was in the top two on the Billboard Hot 200 chart, which was beaten only by Miley Cyrus. Hannah Montana's album had just come out, so that was the number one spot and they were right under that. When they announced the concept at this concert and they said, actually, we're not going to come out, it's going to be this other band, fans were understandably upset until it was revealed that this is still them. And they did the same idea with all of the concerts that went with this album. The tour started February of 2007 and there were 133 shows and at all of them they would come out as the Black Parade, do the shows, step off, come back, and then play whatever other songs from the other albums. And they talked about how the writing process for this album was pretty emotionally tolling because they stayed in the haunted Paramore Mansion. Gerard, while staying there, struggled with night terrors and Mikey was actually so emotionally distressed that he left the band for a period. And then as a 10th anniversary for the Black Parade, they released MCRX Living With Ghosts, which also also released a couple of demos that had been recorded at that haunted manor. So what is the concept behind the Black Parade? To put it simply, you're following a man on his deathbed as he looks back at his life and he thinks about what's gonna come after. The whole idea behind it is that death comes for you as your strongest memory and it leads you on to whatever the next place is. And so for this character, the patient, his strongest memory is his father taking him to see this marching band when he was a kid. And in this interview, Gerard talked about how this album was really difficult to make and they felt like they kind of needed to lean on this alter ego in order to get through it. Another album focused on coming to terms with the fact that death is coming for all of us, with the primary idea behind the album just pushing people to not only live, but to want to live. Yes, death is scary. Yes, life is scary, but take advantage of the time that you have, that type of thing. Be yourself because it's not worth it to live as something that is not true to who you are. Death is coming and you have to choose to live anyways. There are a couple of different ways to interpret this album, which I feel like most people take it chronologically and kind of leave it at that. I have seen some other people saying that it's completely out of order or that there's multiple perspectives from the characters. Specifically, Wendigoon did a pretty big breakdown of this album and he mentioned how it's possible that all of these songs are in completely different order and that depending on whether or not it's acoustic or electric, that tells which character is narrating that song. And I will say it's a really well thought out explanation and I do really, really like that version of things. We're not gonna say it here just because he explains it so well there. Just for consistency, we're gonna go through this album in order and talk about it as if it's telling a chronological story. Or I guess not even that, because we are gonna be talking about potential time skips. Because really, at the end of the day, if this patient is on his deathbed, he's probably thinking back on his life, so it's gonna be jumping between time periods regardless. So the very first thing that we hear coming into this album is the sound of a heart monitor, which immediately sets the scene of a hospital room. The song is called The End, and it introduces us to the protagonist, the patient, which our introduction to him is actually the start of his goodbye to his life. He just got the news that he's gonna die, and at first he really doesn't believe that it's true. He does know what's coming realistically, but he's sarcastic calling out the choices that he made throughout life. He's kind of mocking this whole idea, like how could I be dying so soon when this is what I've done so far, I have so much more to do, that type of thing. The song immediately calls to the theme of being true to yourself while you're alive by saying lines like wipe off that makeup and you might wake up and notice you're someone you're not, which could be talking about this protagonist in his life, but it could also be just straightforward talking to the listener. Like, hey, I just got this news and I regret the person that I've been, don't do this with your own life. And usually kids, when they're talking about future careers and their ideas, they say, when I grow up, I wanna be a teacher, a doctor, a firefighter, whatever. In this case, however, he says, when I grow up, I wanna be nothing at all because he knows that he's not going to get to grow up past this, which is why we can kind of assume that this is a younger adult. But then there's contrast between that and the final lines of the song where he does beg somebody to save him because he's too young to die. And then that song moves straight into dead 
which I saw some people saying that it sounds like the heart monitor flatlines as you transition into dead, which would make sense considering the titles are the end and then dead. So some people are thinking maybe he dies at the very start of this album and then we're just kind of looking through his life after that. But honestly, I just really hate to think it, you know? I wanna be hopeful, even though I know that things are not gonna go well for this person, but in my head, he's still alive and he's thinking back on his memories rather than like that final flash of light where you're seeing all of the things that have happened in your life, you know what I mean? And if we do want to argue that he's still alive, we could look at the line in the bridge where he says he has two more weeks to live, which is presumably what the doctor had told him when he found that out, so I don't know, maybe this is that in-between period of those two weeks? And I didn't really mention the other characters, but along with the patient, we get the doctor who is delivering the news, we get Mother War, which is like this character that we're gonna see as kind of bigger than anything. And then there's also death itself as kind of a personified thing, which is really big in Wendigoon's version of the story because in that death is literally singing half of these songs. But going back to Mother War, they had talked about how that character was kind of inspired by the fact that they all had really strong mothers and specifically this character is representing loss as if she is the mother of all of these people that have passed in the war. And then in this song, we also get that same question that we saw in Revenge, did you get what you deserve? Which is an interesting thing to keep coming up because in the last album, you could kind of say that, did you get what you deserve in the afterlife? Did you get placed in the right place, heaven or hell? But in this, it's like, did you get what you deserve in the way that you died? But regardless, it's saying this patient maybe wasn't the greatest person while they were alive, but they still maybe didn't deserve this. In the bridge, he's sort of hearing from the doctor what's going on with him and what's gonna happen. And then the ending of this song almost feels like it's making a joke out of death because like we saw in the first song, he's kind of being sarcastic about it. He doesn't fully want to believe it and this kind of seems like it's continuing that where he's scared of what comes next but he's also trying to cope with this really devastating news. Straight into the third song on the album we have This Is How I Disappear where in this song he seems to be looking back at memories of a lover but the song kind of paints the picture that the patient is nothing without his lover. He sings there's things that I have done that you should never know and he could be talking about his time at war which we'll see in Mama that he seems to be kind of ashamed of what he's done. And we're gonna see this a lot throughout the album where the patient knows that he wasn't the greatest person in life and now he's having regrets because he's realizing there's nothing he can do to fix those situations. He sings, you wanna see how far down I can sink and it could be talking about a descent into hell like he wasn't the greatest person because religious guilt is another major theme that can be seen throughout all of their songs, I guess, but in this album, this fear of the afterlife and if you've been good or bad, where you're gonna be placed. He knows he did bad things and he knows that there's probably no going back on what he's done, but it's still not something you really want to admit. It seems like there's some distance between himself and the lover, which either could be because they've been separated by the news of his death, or it could just be because of life circumstances. It's possible that he's looking back and reflecting on a previous lover that he's had, but maybe they're no longer together. He feels separated from her, but also just in general, in his life, he feels very alone because like we saw in the song Dead, nobody really likes this guy. They don't really care if he's gonna die. He wasn't the nicest person in life, and because of that, he seems to be alone in these final moments. And then the fourth song on this album is The Sharpest Lives, which on a totally unrelated note, this song always reminds me of World of Warcraft because when I was playing that game at my desk at like three in the morning on school nights in middle school, I would play that album. <laughs> But as for the song itself, the lyrics do go back to the familiar themes of struggling with substance abuse in order to cope with difficult things in life. I feel like this song is pretty similar to Jet Set Life on the last album where it's telling a story of making reckless decisions and having total disregard for the consequences either to yourself or to others. The opening line sets it up pretty clearly, saying that the protagonist is out late, he's sleeping on couches, and even if he looks happy, really, he's not. The chorus again goes into this idea that he's so alone and he's not only losing his sanity, but also the people around him. So he's losing himself he's going farther down this hole but at the same time he's pushing away everybody around him. Where the previous songs are giving us an idea of how he's coping with the news that he's going to die, this song does seem like it's giving us a glimpse into the past, into the life that he had been living up until this point. And with that out of the way, we move into the big song on the album, Welcome to the Black Parade. It's a little bit over five minutes long and the music and the video really give us everything that we need to know about this album, about this concept. Because the whole idea is that when you die, your fondest memory is what takes you to the next place. So for the patient, his fondest memory is when he was a young boy and his father brought him to see the marching band. As his life is fading and he's looking back on everything that he's done, this moment comes back to him. And this is such a beautifully crafted song. The notes and the lyrics and the visuals tie together so well to create such a cohesive story. If you haven't, definitely go and watch the music video for this song specifically. It is so 
good and so representative of everything that they had become. When the patient is a child, his dad asks if he's going to be a savior, which is a pretty big contrast with what we saw from the patient where he said when he's gonna grow up, he's not gonna be anything because he's not gonna have that opportunity. And this again is kind of where we see those religious themes where he's going to be the savior to the beaten and the damned. But it's possible that that expectation from his dad also maybe created some guilt that he feels later in life where he's not living up to that expectation as if he was meant to be the savior and he wasn't. And then the verses kind of go back into that idea of being your true self, which leads us into the chorus with the idea that the world goes on. The world carries on regardless of your death, so you might as well live as authentically as you can in the time that you do have. I definitely feel like that description takes away from how good this song is because I'm sure everybody's gonna have a different interpretation of what it could mean and how they connect to it, but I feel like that's a pretty good general way to describe the vibe of this song. He's been trying his best to be what other people want, and in this moment, as he's facing death, he realizes that it doesn't actually matter what other people think. And then that is the big thing that we follow for the ending of this song, where he sings that the world will never break him and he's not ashamed. We know that he does have guilt and he does have regret, but as the song comes to a close, the patient seems to have found strength. He calls out to all the broken and the outcasts and the misfits of the world, and he says to embrace your scars because it's just a part of who you are. And even as he's standing there as a savior, calling out to the broken, he still doesn't feel like a hero. He's just some guy. There's an entire character arc that can be seen just from this one song where he goes from a kid who's afraid of the world and has these giant expectations placed on his shoulders to a man that's trying his best just to live, just to be in this world. But without getting too caught up on that, we're gonna move to the sixth song on the album, which is I Don't Love You, which does tell us a little bit more about this guy and his romance. In the last song, we weren't really sure if this was a current romance that had just broken up or that was having trouble or if it was just a memory he had been looking back on, but this song does kind of seem to confirm that it's a present day thing where they're not working out. It is possible that the couple had broken up prior to his hospitalization, but to me, it really seems like they broke up after finding out that news because that is a fairly common thing that happens where when a couple gets bad news, the partner that isn't directly affected by it decides they can't deal with all of that, so they leave. And sometimes the person that is sick or injured or whatever it is will encourage their partner to leave to be like, hey, I don't blame you for moving on, like I want you to live the rest of your life, that type of thing. But sometimes it just feels really bad where it's like that person who has a choice is saying, I'm not gonna be here to support you, even though you're clearly in a bad place and things are gonna get worse for a time. I'm gonna leave to protect myself. It's obviously a very hard thing to decide to do, like from both sides. And I'm not gonna sit here and say there's any one right way to handle that situation, but it seems like that's what happened here, where they found out that the patient is not going to make it and then the lover decided to leave. That's the feeling that I get from this song, just because of how heartbreaking it is. He says that if she does leave, he won't try to stop her because he knows that there's no way for them to work out. And it's not even worth being mad about prior decisions or prior arguments or anything like that, because regardless, it's all going to end. I mean, he even seems like he's going to get mad about the way that she is, but he kind of trails off because what's even the point? And then in the chorus, obviously he is singing out, if you don't love me, would you even tell me or would you just leave? Would you just walk away? From the other song, we already got this feeling that the patient feels like he's nothing without his love, but in this we learn that she can walk away like it's nothing. And I read that Gerard talked about how this song is about being defiant and existing even when other people may not like you, which I really, really, really like the word defiant for describing this album as a whole. The whole idea of dying and feeling like you didn't do good enough or regretting certain decisions and coming to a point where you're all alone, but still living defiantly, still choosing to live despite all of that. At the end of the song, it does seem like the couple has split off and it doesn't seem like the patient wanted the relationship to end, but really what choice do they have? House of Wolves does a full 180 and brings us straight back to the younger patient's reckless lifestyle, which Gerard had said that this song is like walking through a bar in the afterlife and being reminded of sin, which is where we're gonna see more of that religious trauma or guilt coming back in. Because this entire song is really suggesting that the patient, when he dies, is going to be going to hell. And depending on whether or not we think the patient is dead at this point, this could either be referring to him like literally walking into hell, like this is the scenery around him, or it could be him thinking about his fear over what's going to potentially be waiting for him. The first verse lets us know that the patient does feel remorse for his decisions, but to be fair, I don't know if he's genuinely feeling the guilt or if he's only saying that as an afterthought now that he knows what's going to come. Living so recklessly for your whole life, but then when you face the end, 
you all of a sudden try to backtrack and say, no, I wasn't that bad, I wasn't that bad. We keep saying he hasn't been the greatest person, but it seems like he didn't really feel bad for it until he started facing consequences and he started to think about what this actually means. He keeps bouncing between saying that he's an angel, but then saying that he's also a bad man. He is acknowledging that he's done bad things, but at the same time, he's brushing it all aside in an attempt to be perceived well. He lived his whole life without really caring about the consequences, and now he's stuck in this battle between embracing it and trying to get away with it. Throughout the entire second verse, there's a reference to the nursery rhyme, Ring Around the Rosie, which continues the idea that he's been careless with his life and he didn't really think that seriously about the consequences because that is like a children's nursery rhyme. So it kind of gives a more playful feeling, even though clearly the subject matter is very dark. Instead of Ring Around the Rosie, it's Ring Around the Ambulance like you never gave a care. And then as we get through the end of the song, he does seem to be a bit more upfront about the fact that he's been a bad man and that's, that's all there is to it. Straight back into maybe the saddest song on this album, Cancer. We went from this powerhouse of rebellion to the pain that comes from his diagnosis. We did a lot of reflecting, but this song kind of takes us back to the present moment where he is actively thinking about the fact that he's dying and this is the reason why he has been diagnosed with cancer. In an interview with NME, Gerard talks about how this cancer is being used as a metaphor, although in that interview, I don't think he explicitly says what the metaphor is, but there is also a part of it that's talking directly about the disease because they aim to write the darkest song ever by capturing this very real and devastating experience. He's making preparations for his funeral. He's thinking about what everybody's gonna do after, but at the same time, he's self-conscious of his appearance and he doesn't he doesn't want to be perceived like this, even though everybody is very aware of what's happening. He's coming to terms with what this means for the rest of his life, how he's going to be missing out on a lot of experiences, because again, this is a young person that's dying. He still thought he had a whole life ahead of him, and now all of a sudden that's being taken away. He's counting down the days that he has left as if those individual days aren't even worth living. He is just suffering through them at this point. He's waiting. And the song ends with the patient saying that the hardest part out of all of this is having to say goodbye. And really even having to leave what you thought you were going to become, you know? Like seeing your future self as something to say goodbye to. That takes us into the ninth song on this album, which is Mama. And this does go back to that idea of going to hell where he straight up says, we're all gonna die and go to hell. It does sound like there are bombs going off as this song starts. So that sets the scene at war. We can assume this takes place during the patient's time at war where he's writing a letter to his mother. And it seems like they don't have the best of relationships. It's traumatic and dangerous and you have to make decisions that could haunt you for the rest of your life. And it seems like he is embracing the fact that he is doing bad things and maybe he didn't have that much of a choice, but his mother seems to have her own opinions about him. He says, you should have raised a baby girl. I should have been a better son, which is probably talking about the fact that if he had been a girl, he wouldn't have had to go to the war at all. But I would like to mention that this song, specifically this line also resonates with a lot of trans listeners. You should have raised a baby girl. I should have been a better son. It seems like his mom, really both his parents actually, expected a lot from him and he agrees that he could have been a better son, yes, but he's also just a man. The same thing as we saw when he was talking about his dad and being a savior, he says, I'm just a man. And the later half of the song reveals that his mother might have actually rejected him without saying, you're not my son. Like, you're not, you're no son of mine. <laughs> she says, don't come back. And whether this is because of his actions during or before the war, one thing is pretty clear, and that is that she wants nothing to do with him. And then on the other side of things, we hear the singer crying out for his mom, which is similar to how a scared child would, which makes sense if he's out on the battlefield, he's facing all of these terrors. He's like a little kid calling back to his mom and she is not there, she's flat out rejected him. The bridge is sung by Liza Minnelli and it sounds like she's trying to be comforting, but it almost feels like it's too little too late. And then at the end of the song, Gerard confirms we're damned after all, which does show acceptance of what's coming and it also ties throughout the entire song. Some people did die on the battlefield, yes, but he's gonna carry on, he's gonna continue to fight. And the final lines of the song make it seem like the soldiers that are remaining might even be hoping for death. Like they've been through so much. They're honoring those who have passed, but they also are recognizing that their own lives could be ending pretty shortly. The next day, the people that are left will be mourning them. And then the final thing that we hear in this song, like how the song started with bombs, the final thing that we hear is a woman crying and we can assume that this is a mother mourning the loss of her child in the war. It was clear that there was some tension between the patient and his mother and she wasn't there when he really needed her, but it seems like now it might be too late. Sleep is the song that ties back to Gerard's experience at the Haunted Manor where he was having these sleep terrors and it actually starts with an audio file where he's talking about 
how that experience was. And if I could describe this song in one word, it would be apathy. It seems like there is very little care for anything. It seems like in this part of the story, the patient has accepted he's going to hell, like he's done what he's done, he's going to die, this is just how it's gonna happen. And it seems like that acceptance has almost led him to be numb towards the entire idea. Where House of Wolves was very chaotic and very loud, and he was coming to terms with the fact that he will be probably going to hell, this one kind of shows the hopelessness of the situation where it feels like he doesn't even have that guilt anymore. He sings that he's not sorry for what he's done, which completely contradicts what we've been seeing up until this point. He doesn't feel the same guilt and shame and regret that he's had. In the second verse, he drinks to all the good and the bad and says, three cheers for tyranny, which could be a reference back to the last album, but it's also followed by a line that says he won't be coming back, which is unlike the character that we saw in Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge. And then the ending of this song goes back to that audio of Gerard and his real experiences with the Night Terrors. And you can hear this back and forth of just sleep and wake up being yelled. And you can really feel how difficult that experience must have been where yes, you want to sleep, but also with sleep comes these terrible visions. And then I honestly don't have much to say about teenagers just because the message is fairly straightforward and you could say that it's talking about maybe the patient when he was younger and he was being reckless and he was being kind of scary, or it could be when he's a little bit older and he's thinking back on young people. But it also just straight up talks about how teenagers can be mean to each other. And if we're thinking about the fact that the patient wasn't well liked, maybe he was bullied in school. How the experiences and circumstances that he was facing as a young child led him to acting out as he grew up, I don't know. I feel like this song kind of just stands on its own. And it happens to be the only song on their Spotify that has over 1 billion plays. So they did something right with this one. <laughs> there are three songs left to talk about in this album, the first one being Disenchanted. And this song continues that feeling of hopelessness that the patient has where he's coming to terms with his death and he feels like life as a whole is overrated. Even when you try to make your life mean something at the end of the day, it never really does because it's still gonna end and then what? And it almost seems like he's referring to his life as being something other than his life. He's saying he watched it on a screen. He's completely separated from the things that he's done. He hates the ending, which is what we're currently experiencing, but it started with an all right scene, which could potentially be tying all the way back to his memory of when he was a young boy watching this parade. And throughout the whole song, he just keeps repeating the idea that nothing really matters. He went from regret and guilt to just wallowing in his sadness and his hopelessness, and honestly, fair enough. It's completely understandable. Like, what else can you do in this situation? Famous Last Words brings us the final song of this character arc. There is one more song after, but <laughs> you'll see. It's not really. This is the final song. This is easily one of my favorite songs from the band, and it really leaves you with a sense of hope after something that felt so hopeless. Because if the whole point of all of this is to make people want to live, how are you getting that message across when the previous song felt so low and so hopeless and like, what's the point of living when it's all going to end? The music video is very intense and pretty much everybody got hurt while filming on set. And I couldn't find a source for this, but I saw a lot of people across different threads saying that this song is for Mikey. Like this was the thing that got him back after he had left the band when he was having the emotional distress from the mansion. I have no clue how true that is, but it was either that this song was written specifically for him to get him back or that he had listened to the demo and once he heard it, he knew that he wanted to come back. Most of the genius page about this song is specifically talking about how the lyrics could tie into Mikey. So regardless, I think the song kind of speaks for itself. The chorus flat out says, I am not afraid to keep on living. At this point, the patient has accepted his fate and he might not live, right? He might not make it very long, but he's gonna go out strong and he's no longer afraid of what's happening next. This song, it truly hurts my heart in the best way to listen to it because it is painful, but it's also very inspiring and very motivating. Again, living defiantly, that's really, that's what this song feels like. It feels like living defiantly and choosing to be alive. And this song does kind of leave the story open where it doesn't explicitly say whether or not the patient dies. I will say considering how the rest of the album is going, I would assume that you know, no matter how defiantly you want to live, if cancer's coming for you, there might not be a way out of that. He still knew that his life was coming to an end, it's just now he recognized that it's not something to be afraid of. Death is coming for us all, and as soon as you can come to terms with that, you can start living in spite of it. And then that takes us to Blood, which is the actual last track on the album, but it is a hidden track and it starts with a minute and a half of complete silence. It's kind of a comedic relief after such a dark, heavy album. The sound is fun, but the lyrics are not. The lyrics are actually very gruesome. In his head, 
he went through all of these memories, he was reflecting on his life, he was feeling his regret and his guilt, he felt hopeless, and then he's choosing to live, and then he's kind of back in the reality of being in a hospital and being- going through all these treatments. And it's like, yes, you're now feeling motivated and you're feeling like you want to live, but the life just that's happening kind of sucks. The entire album is really focused on encouraging people to want to live and to live authentically, but then this song kind of rounds it out by sarcastically playing with the fact that even if you do choose to live with everything that you have, things are probably still not going to be that great. <laughs> Especially after such a very powerful song, this kind of feels like a unserious way to finish the story, but I kind of love it. Because it does kind of reflect how unserious life is. You go through all these mental and physical struggles and then you turn around and it's like, okay, back to my 9 to 5. But anyways, that is the end of the Black Parade. Does he die? Maybe. Possible. Does he choose to live? Yes, absolutely. And in a 2014 interview with Enemy, Gerard talked about how he had never imagined pulling out another album after the Black Parade. So to them, this was it. They had three big albums and then they were gonna be done. They built up all this hype, they created this whole world revolving around the alter ego, they told a really big cohesive story and now it's over. But the thing is there actually is one more album. And I know it's a bit worrying. I said we're gonna be talking about My Chemical Romance lore and there's still a whole album left, but here we are at the end of the video. The final album is called Danger Days, The True Lives of the Fabulous Killjoys. And I'm actually gonna save that album for another day. Underwhelming ending to the video, I know, I'm sorry. The reason is this album has two music videos and six comic books that build the world. And like I said at the very beginning, I saw some people saying how each of those different forms tell a different version of the story where it's not like a cohesive timeline but it's more just bits and pieces of the world. Like they contradict each other and they don't really tell this one story, they all just tell their own separate things. I still think it would be kind of fun to explore the world in its entirety, not just from the album. And I knew that if I were to look for all the comics and to try and do all of that, that I would not be able to do it justice in this video. If that is something that you guys are interested in, then please let me know. I'm not gonna make it like a top priority video, but it is something that I have in the back of my mind because honestly, I love that album so much. I really love specifically the aesthetics of Danger Days, so I wanted to make sure that if I do it, I do it justice. But if you do just want an explanation of that album, there are a lot of people that have already made videos about it, so don't wait around for me, you know? Sorry to end on a disappointment like that, but I simply cannot go through all of that material and try to piece it together right now. Plus they'll leave something for me to look forward to, so. Is there anything that I missed or are there things that you interpreted differently? But as always, discuss nicely in the comments, okay? If you are not a member of the band itself, don't come into the comments acting like you know it all, okay? We're not doing that. Unless you have sources. <laughs> and speaking of sources, I'll be sure to link as much as I can in the description of everything that I looked at, all the interviews and all the fan content and everything. I'll try my best to link everything that I used in the description in case you're curious to look into it further. With that being said, thank you so much for making it through this video. If there are any other topics you would like to see me look into, then you can also leave those in the comments. But that's all I got for you for right now. Okay, see you around.